Okay, thank you. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to present uh, some, a study we did to understand the structure and magma plumbing system of Newbury Volcano, which was the site of the field trips prior to the workshop, so it's located nearby. And in particular, we collected a transect of pretty dense uh, seismic data that illustrates the power and needs of uh, full wave field imaging. And so that's going to be the sort of gist of my talk. And the graduate students who did most of the work are Matt Beachley and Ben Heath. Ben Heath has a poster here. It's poster number nine. <clears throat> so this is an outline. You don't need to read the whole thing because it'll come up as I go through it. But uh, I'm going to uh, explain what the problems are and then go over I w the session is dirt, desktop, and dissemination, and then point towards the future. So um, magma plumbing beneath volcanoes is an interesting question. We have a good idea of where volcanoes are, but constraining the magma plumbing system remains difficult. And this is because uh, magma bodies are often very small and volcanoes are extremely heterogeneous. Uh, and in particular, the deep magma plumbing system is uh, particularly difficult to understand. And I'm not going to address that in this talk. Uh, I'm going to, this is a map from the USGS that shows uh, different volcanoes in the Pacific Northwest and their hazard level. And you can see the Cascade Arc. I'm going to talk about Newbury Volcano, which is located just uh, behind the volcanic arc. And it is one of the very high threat uh, volcanoes and uh, is very hot, so it's a good target. So to illustrate um, the difficulty of imaging magma bodies, I'm going to show you a, a finite difference waveform a simulation of an explosion traveling through a small magma body. So this has a simple velocity depth gradient that's uniform throughout the model, and then we've superimposed a low velocity magma body. Uh, in the pink are the compressional waves. These calculations were done with E3D. And in the green are the shear waves. So, oh, there it goes. So you see the wave traveling. It'll repeat a few times. And you see it distorted by the magma body. Uh, the wave front is nice and then it is indented as it travels through the magma body. It will pause here and show you the indentation. And then you can see the wave front healing as this wave is going to propagate on. And by the time this wave arrives at the surface, there's almost no travel time anomaly. There is an amplitude anomaly. And then running it here again is to show you that energy is actually focused through the magma body and comes up to the surface at a different angle. And so this illustrates that because the magma body is relatively small, the um, Travel time tomography is limited in addressing this problem because the wave field heals. And so if we can densely sample the seismic wave field, we can use amplitudes and also use laser arrivals in the coda to actually get a better idea of the structure. And uh, this requires waveform modeling. So. Um, one way to address this problem, and that's the dirt part, is to uh, install closely spaced seismometers. And so this is an illustration of a seismic experiment we did in 2008. And we deployed 81 L22 seismometers from Pascal. They're spaced 300 meters apart over the top and the upper flanks of the volcano. And they're spaced 800 meters apart on the flanks. And you can see uh, the outline of the caldera faults shown in red on this topographic map. Uh, the sensor is a three-component sensor, and it has a natural frequency of two hertz. We, um, the shot is 9013, and that was, uh, we, it was actually a piggyback experiment on the High Lava Plains experiment. So the location of that shot really governed the orientation of our line. Uh, in terms of data collection in the field, uh, one thing we did to try and facilitate collect, uh, installing so many instruments was to use uh, this battery pack that's shown here that Pascal uh, suggested, which has eight of these D-cell batteries wired together. 
uh, to provide 12 volts and 180 amp hours. And these uh, ran the sites for almost four weeks. And they made it easy to deploy a large number of stations. In the lower picture on the left, they're actually in that white cardboard box in the black bag. Uh, and so, that, you know, once you want to deploy a lot of instruments, this becomes uh, an issue. Of course, they're not rechargeable. Uh, we also did the work by including volunteer teams, and this provide, uh, involved the public and was also a great research experience for a variety of students. Uh, some of the students were very young. And the, uh, so... Um, we piggybacked on the western shot of the high lava plains experiment. So our experiment is shown in pink in this map. Uh, you see some of the geology. There are a number of fault zones that seem to intersect at Newbury. And we were also able to use these uh, wonderful legacy data sets that the USGS collected in the 1980s and that were actually uh, archived in the IRIS DMC. So archiving this legacy data set is really valuable. Uh, the red triangles and red stars are a, an experiment they did with 110 instruments and about 16 shots. And then there was a long refraction line that's shown in the blue symbols. This is the seismic data set from the 2008 seismic experiment. And uh, it's the vertical component record section. The shot is off to the west, so uh, range is increasing towards uh, me, at least on this figure. And they're, they're reduced at six kilometers per second. You can see a very clear arrival uh, on the side of the volcano near the shot, and then actually an increase, a, a decrease in travel time over the volcano. So it has a, a large high velocity core. Uh, but there is also a loss of amplitude, especially as you get to the far side of the caldera. And then the energy picks up again on the far side of the volcano. Because we had such densely spaced instruments, we're able to recognize the secondary arrival that's outlined in pink uh, in, this, in the coda of this data. And when you look at the data from 1983, it's very hard to recognize these arrivals because the instrument spacing is wider. The, we were very lucky, and in the two, three weeks that these instruments were out, they also recorded a number of very nice teleseisms. And uh, the distribution of the teleseisms is shown in the lower left. The upper right shows the vertical channel data for uh, one of these, uh, the nicer examples. And you can see there's a remarkable coherence uh, in the teleseismic wave field, but also variability on very short length scales. And that's quite interesting for teleseismic arrival. Uh, you also see there's considerable complexity of the wave field uh, beneath the caldera, right? that's where the instruments are more closely spaced in the diagram. So to just uh, show you some of the observations we made, this is a plot of teleseismic relative delay times measured by cross-correlation. And we did this uh, at a couple of different frequencies, 0 0.7, 0 0.5, and 0 0.3 hertz. Uh, and what I wanted to really illustrate here, you can see the details on Ben's poster, is that we see travel time variations of plus or mi and minus 0.2 seconds, so a total variation of 0.4 seconds across very short spatial scales, and there are coherent variations on about uh, five kilometers. So this teleseismic data on these dense arrays can be really useful for shallow structure. So now I'm going to show some of the analyses that we did with this data. I'm going to start by talking about travel time tomography. We did this both uh, for the active shots. I'll start with that. And then we integrated the teleseismic data with the refraction data. And then I'll show you how what we can do with the tomography is limited, and we really can get a lot more information by using the waveforms. So this is a result from the travel time tomography of the active source data uh, on the Left-hand column are the shallower depths going down, and then uh, right-hand side goes deeper. Uh, the areas that are kind of massed out are uh, with poor coverage. The, again, the red uh, lines show the caldera faults. So coming from the surface down, you see uh, low velocities, probably caldera infill in the center of the caldera, and this very beautiful ring of high velocities beneath the caldera faults, probably some kind of uh, dikes in that region. And then uh, at about uh, three kilometers depth, the low velocity sort of 
tapers off, and then we get an increasing low velocity as we go down to four and five kilometers depth, and these high velocities extend off to the east and west in these broader high velocity shoulders. And um, so this is the region where uh, we interpret there to be a magma chamber. However, and the the high velocity shoulders are probably cooled intrusives. However, the uh, velocity anomaly that we're recovering here is pretty small, and it can be explained just by elevated temperature. Uh, so this is not indicative of any kind of magma chamber, really. Uh, however, if you do some resolution tests, you see that you can actually hide a very large magma chamber in this data. And so the top shows a synthetic model that we generated, uh, one is a slice, the upper uh, panel is a slice through the model at um, about four kilometers depth, minus two kilometers in elevation by above sea level. And then the, the lower row shows uh, depth slices and the caldera is the red bar at the top. Uh, and so we superimpose a pure, completely molten body on top of our seismic velocity model. And then we trace rays through this model uh, for the geometry that we had, and we invert this data uh, with the tomography code, and what we recover is the central column there. So we're getting very poor recovery, about 8%. And so the wavefront healing is aggravated or made even worse by the fact that these are, there are these high velocities around the magma chamber, making it very easy for the seismic energy to propagate around. On the right-hand side, you see the tomography that was actually recovered from the observed data, and its structure is very similar to that which we're recovering from the synthetic. And so, really, from the tomography, we can say that we have anywhere from no melt and just hot temperatures to 60 kilometers cubed of melt. So it's not a very tightly constrained problem. So one thing that um, Ben has worked on that's really nice is combining these teleseismic arrivals with the refraction experiment. And the top panel really shows how this teleseismic wavefront generates very nice crossing rays with the refraction experiments and so uh, can give you better resolution. And the um, velocity anomalies recovered are shown in the coupled model below and we're getting a 10% change in VP in this coupled model. Here's a, a, some more figures showing uh, the coupled model in absolute velocity, and in the lower left, you can actually see the changes in velocity with respect to the earlier tom tomographic models. So there's, there's a big uh, amplification of the low velocity anomaly. All right, so I'm going to show you how um, the tomography is limited and the, by some waveform modeling. So at the top is the seismic data from the shot, and at the bottom is a finite difference waveform modeling through our tomographic velocity model. And you can see that we can reproduce the travel times, but that's about all we reproduce. The amplitude drop at the far side of the caldera is not there, and there are no secondary arrivals. So um, this is uh, what the model looks like. Uh, in this magma chamber model, we have a mush zone, so there's more melt at the top and more crystals accumulating at the bottom. And, we, and in these models, you have to specify VPVS, density, uh, attenuation, and this shows the boundaries that absorb the waves so they don't rattle around in the box. Okay, now I'm focusing in on that region of amplitude drop and the secondary arrival, and that model I just chose you much better reproduces some of these features uh, in the data. In fact, this model is not unique. So uh, we played with three different geologically motivated models. Uh, the top one is the one I showed with the graded mush. The second one has the crystals suspended throughout the magma body. And the last one is a purely molten sill. And you can see that they all look a little bit different, but that they all have some similar features as well. And so we tried to quantify some of uh, these comparisons by looking at the actual arrival time of the secondary phase. They're also the depth and width of these are tuned to match the data. Um, we looked at the amplitude of the secondary phase, and we looked at the amplitude of the primary phase, which I'm not going to show you. But uh, really, when you look at the misfits for these different um, things you can quantify, we can't really distinguish between these models. And so in terms of volume of actual melt, so not counting the crystals, we have a range now of 
In the suspended mush model, we have about two kilometers cubed of melt, and in the melt sill model, we go up to eight kilometers cubed of melt. So the solution is not unique, but we have a much narrower constraint now on um, what the magmatic system beneath Newbury might be. The teleseismic data similarly um, has some really valuable information in the waveforms. And so now, now I'm not showing you the vertical channel, I'm showing you the radial and transverse. And both of these channels have large components. In fact, the amplitudes of the radial and the transverse are about equal to that of the vertical in the caldera. Um, the large amplitudes indicate that there is really complex subsurface, and to get such big energy on the transverse, we need scattering, dipping reflectors, and isotropy, or there's some considerable complexity, which really is not surprising given our velocity model. When we propagate waves through the coupled model that uh, Ben generated, we get the uh, synthetic waveforms on the left, and I've circled the uh, uh, radial there, and here is the vertical to emphasize that these synthetic models are, are not generating the kind of complexity over the caldera that we observe. And again, we can insert some kind of magma body and show that uh, particularly when you put pretty low VS in, we can get uh, this kind of reverberation of energy uh, on the radial channel. And so this you know, there's a lot of information in the waveforms, but it's also non-unique, and you really need to go to full waveform inversion to get the full information out of the waveforms here. And so in summary of the analysis, uh, coupling teleseisms with shots it really improves tomography. Uh, the waveforms uh, recorded on a densely spaced array can really give you some very valuable information in the CODA. Um, finite difference waveform modeling is really useful uh, for looking at the structure, and uh, we've better constrained what might be beneath the volcano. Okay, um, I was also asked to talk about dissemination. We've done the usual theses and uh, scientific publications, but I was asked to do this, I think, because I uh, made a 10-minute video for the public. So Newbury is in Oregon, it's nearby, and it's a lot of people visit it. So we had done a simple MATLAB movie, and then I worked with some digital arts students who made this beautiful animation of the magma chamber tucked up inside these high velocities, which are the gray rocks. Uh, and uh, you know, it, was, it included some video and some other little demos. And this YouTube video is being used in the classrooms that I know of are listed there. Uh, it's had some uh, number of views on YouTube and some discussions. And it's, uh, I think it's just starting to show at the Lava Lands Visitor Center right nearby here. Uh, so visitors who come will see it. And uh, it, I, I'll try and play it at Ben Heath's poster this afternoon. If you look for it on YouTube, look at the one with me in the pink blouse, not the white one, because they. I was very stiff in the first time they interviewed me, <laughs> and so they redid it. <laughs> Plus, you're not supposed to wear white, wear white when you're being interviewed, so there you go. Uh, okay, so this is my last slide, and uh, so I really want to finish by pointing towards the future. Um, in terms of volcanoes, I think recording the full wave field is really going to be incredibly powerful. And uh, volcanoes have a very small scale, very heterogeneous structure, this real juxtaposition of low and high velocities and three-dimensionality makes it a difficult problem, and the magma bodies are also small. And so this requires dense sampling of the wave field in three dimensions. You can see the limitations of our 2D line. Um, it will require on the order of 10 to the 3 seismometers deployed for several months if you want to collect some teleseisms. And uh, for full waveform inversion, you need to sample half the seismic wavelength. So depending on the scale of the structure you want, that's the station spacing you need. So a 3D experiment um, that's 10 by 10 kilometers at 250 meter spacing would require 1,600 stations. Uh, but if you want to actually look at the deeper magma plumbing system, maybe 15 to 15 kilometers-ish, you probably require about a 100 kilometer aperture. You might be able to do this by going 2.5D, so doing a long rectangular box would give you enough azimuthal coverage uh, without really using 
an excessive amount of stations. So you could do something that was 100 by 15, but that's already 2,400 stations. So the other option is to use shots, which is the geometry that we use in the marine uh, setting. And so for these experiments, the, the logistical constraints are really important. Ease of deployment, weight of the whole package, access. That makes a lot of volcanoes in Alaska difficult. Um, longevity is important depending on how long you want to record for, uh, and that trades off with battery weight. Analysis of this data is challenging. First of all, you have to store a large amount of data. Uh, then um, the analysis is, com is complicated. You need industry-level full waveform inversion codes. Some of these are acoustic. Some of these are fully elastic. Do you include anisotropy or not? Um, you need high-performance computing facilities. These are definitely large parallel computing problems. And, of course, you need advanced visualization to actually uh, look at the data and the results. Thank you very much.